this last session of SLER 2021, uh, we'll start with uh, our third invite uh, speaker, uh, Sebastian Turbo, that is going to uh, give um, a talk on accelerating learning ecosystem, uh, a living lab approach. And this uh, invited speech will introduce uh, the debate that uh, we will have uh, immediately after on a smart learning ecosystem as engine of a new normality. So um, uh, let me uh, introduce uh, Sebastian. Uh, Sebastian uh, Turbo uh, is uh, uh, the, the CEO uh, and the chef strategist of uh, Eco6. is a Canada-based consultancy uh, that uh, collaborate with a lot of government, cities, business, and uh, also with the civil society. Um, and the main goal is to uh, create an uh, engaged platform and that have, uh, make possible to turn in action uh, ideas. Uh, Sebastian uh, it's also currently a research fellow of uh, uh, WISER. I don't know how you pronounce it, but it's World Innovation Summit for Innovation. Uh, and uh, where uh, is leading uh, the Learning Ecosystem Living Lab, the research on Learning Ecosystem Living Lab. And that's why uh, uh, it attracted our attention as uh, as the community, because of course uh, we are very interested in what is going on on learning ecosystem. Um, from uh, 1910 to 1917, uh, Sebastian uh, uh, was also a senior lecturer, uh, a lecturer at the Science uh, uh, Paris and the Cells of Paris uh, à la Sorbonne. Uh, so uh, Sebastian, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Carlo, and uh, thank you for for having me for for having us as as wise on this uh, in this conference and on this session. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon for where wherever you are. Let me share my screen and start my presentation. Um, So as, as Carla was saying, I'm here this morning to talk to you about you know, accelerating learning ecosystems, um, a living lab approach. Uh, basically, I'll be telling you the kind of history behind why's and learning ecosystems and why we felt uh, designing a living lab was, uh, was an interesting way to try to support our community. Just very quickly, I mean, I know Carla just introduced myself, but I want to come back on two points, which kind of explains the story here is uh, from 2012 to 2017, I was the executive director, executive director, I was content director at WISE, the World Innovation Summit for Education. So basically I spent five years uh, being, being the lucky person kind of, you know, curating all the content for WISE with a, a really global approach, you know, a global future of education approach, uh, you know, looking at teacher training, looking at ed tech, uh, MOOCs, you know, 21st century skills, creativity, really the whole nine yards of the future of education conversation. In 2017, I left WISE and moved here to Montreal to lead the New Cities Foundation, where I spent uh, three years uh, this time at the heart of the future of cities conversation, looking at you know smart cities, green cities, resilient cities, uh, looking at the future of mobility. And as I moved from WISE to New Cities, you know I got curious of where does my former education um, conversation meet my new more city territory based conversation with new cities. And this is where I, I rediscovered because I had heard of it, but, but vaguely I kind of rediscovered um, the, the whole concept and approach around learning ecosystems and, and learning cities. I find it I found it so fascinating that indeed, when I left new cities I created Eco6, um, a small consultancy here working on urban ecosystems, focusing on learning in, edu in education, um, uh, and actually approached, I mean, had, uh, had conversations with my former friends and colleague at WISE just around trying to take the, taking the concept further, and ha hence my role uh, as we speak as senior fellow on the WISE Learning Ecosystem Living Lab, which I will 
come, come, come uh, and explain later. Maybe quickly for some of you who are less familiar with WISE, WISE is a global innovation hub funded by the Qatar Foundation. It started in 2009 more as a global forum, you know, the Davos of, uh, of education. It then became more of a global innovation platform. And today WISE prides itself uh, in being a truly global innovation hub uh, on, on the future of education. We currently focus on five thematic tracks, ed tech, uh, learning sciences uh, and well-being, innovation for quality and access, and oh wait, sorry, just need to move this up. Uh, education leadership and learning ecosystems. So this whole learning ecosystems conversation within Wise has really become one of the one of the five key pillars of the work uh, of Wise. Uh, just a quick kind of intro here on what we see as a kind of general context around learning ecosystems. This is probably stuff you're very familiar with as well, just to, to, to kind of tell you where we were coming from. Uh, of course, like many others, we see learning ecosystems as possibly a way to rethink and to remake learning, uh, remake learning that is really focused on experienced-based forms of learning, uh, informal, play-based learning, project-based learning. Uh, learning ecosystems could, for us, also help us actually deliver on the concept of lifelong learning that we've been talking about for a while. We see learning happening, you know, across uh, networks of learning providers. So not only formal education, but also more non-formal education uh, providers. We see learning ecosystems as a way to, to be able to really personalize our learning around pathways and journeys, and really to reconnect learning with the quote unquote real world, outside world, uh, whatever you want to you want to call it. We're noticing a growing research and academic interest on the this idea of learning ecosystems. I guess this conference is actually a good uh, a good point, uh, I mean, good, good case in point for that. We're noticing that these researches, not all of them, but like the kind of general trend is around you know mapping actors and projects, trying to understand uh, trends and best practices, trying to make the case for learning ecosystems, and also trying to define the concept. More recently, we're also noticing a growing interest from policymakers. Uh, on the bottom left of the, the screen, you see a report that was made for the French government. On the right, more interestingly, um, in February 2021, so post-election in the US, a group of leading um, education NGOs, education foundations, um, have kind of uh, un united themselves to try to lobby the White House, the Biden administration, in launching um, uh, a federal national White House learning ecosystems uh, initiative and eventually policy. Um, so we find this really interesting. And this, uh, both of these, these items are actually uh, fairly recent. We're also noticing a growing number of projects labeled as learning ecosystems uh, or labeling themselves. I put a few names here. I could have completely filled the slide with names, of course, but just wanted to highlight a few of the, of the projects uh, that we've identified or other I have identified for us. So that was the kind of general context. Now, where does this link between WISE and learning ecosystems happen? So as I was saying, it's now become one of the five key pillars, key tracks uh, of WISE. Um, this learning ecosystems track, the objectives for WISE are, are to use place-based co-design approaches to mobilize formal and informal actors. It's to map out the, the local and global landscape and identify opportunities for collaboration, trying to create the blueprint for a le learning ecosystem in Qatar, and to finally to pilot informal learning programs with ecosystems coalitions uh, around the world. Uh, concretely speaking, um, for pillars within the track, there is a learning ecosystem action research uh, component, uh, which my colleague, uh, my colleague Aurelio, who will be on the panel, will tell you more about in a, in a few minutes. There's a program we call Learn, Learner's Voice, and then there's the advocacy side uh, with the Living Lab that I'll be talking about, and also a big learning festival, the Doha Learning Days, that happen every two years in Doha to kind of support and spread the word and you know, advocate for uh, learning, learning ecosystems uh, approach. In 2019, WISE commissioned the Innovation Unit uh, with Valerie Hannon to develop kind of a 
report or research report on learning ecosystems for wise. It's called local learning ecosystems, emerging models. Um, this uh, work uh, led to kind of a def a wise, I mean, quote unquote, wise definition of, of learning ecosystems, uh, where we see learning ecosystems as comprising diverse combination of providers, schools, businesses, community organizations, as well as government agencies in creating new learning opportunities and pathways to success. We also see these learning ecosystems as usually being supported by an innovative credentialing system or technology platform that can replace or augment the traditional linear system of examinations and graduations. Uh, we can discuss uh, after my keynote, uh, you know, the, the plus and the minuses of the of the definition. But this is the the the, de the definition of learning ecosystems where we're working around. But then, you know, the the question that Wise and myself and Eco6, the, the question we ask ourselves is. How could WISE further support its community in accelerating learning ecosystems? Um, there was this research track, there was the Learner's Voice program, the, the Learning Festival. What did we mean? The question we had was how can we be more useful to our community or to a wider community? community interested in learning ecosystems? Uh, and how, how, how can we basically support them? What people were, was, were telling us is that what they felt was missing was that you know, kind of how to resources. Indeed, people were telling us, look, there's more and more research, there's more and more papers out there, there's more and more projects, but you know, we still feel that there's a lack of access to knowledge, to a community of practice, and kind of practical guidelines on how to build and manage learning ecosystem. Um, you know, how do you look at questions around leadership uh, within learning ecosystem collaboration models? Uh, what type of pedagogies are more adapted to, to learning ecosystems? So we felt strongly that if we wanted to support our community, this kind of how to approach was the right way to go. Because indeed, you know, if you're looking at uh, designing and launching a learning ecosystem, you know, it can be quite complex. On the one hand, you want to transform the core of learning, and this means looking at learning cultures, learn learning structures, human capital, assessment and credentialing, but it also means transforming su su supporting systemic structures like funding, public will, leadership and policy, community ownership. So lots of elements, lots of elements of context to take into account when looking at trying to, to, to design and launch a learning ecosystem. So hence, in 2020, the launch of the WISE Learning Ecosystems Living Lab. But before maybe I go into telling you what the lab is, why a living lab and kind of what and what is uh, what is a living lab? I guess this kind of living lab concept emerged in the mid, uh, mid um, uh, 2005, 2006, with this whole kind of notion of, you know, user-centric design. Uh, here, this is a cover from Time Magazine from 2006, where the person of the year was you. It was us, it was us as the users. Uh, this was coming from the more kind of digital technological world of really rethinking the way we design products not only for the user, but with the user. This led several years later to the creation of this concept of Living Lab. Uh, it was first coined by Professor Bill Mitchell, Mitchell who was the Dean of the MIT School of Arch Architecture and Planning. Uh, by the way, interesting for our conversation, he's also rec recognized as one of the masterminds behind the kind of smart city series. And so indeed for him, his, his kind of first definition, Living Labs were originally referred to spaces built to observe how technology and humans interacted. And his initial definition of a living lab was a research methodology for sensing, prototyping, validating, and refining complex solutions in multiple and involving real life contexts. This definition of living labs has evolved. Um, they've become somewhat broader and more diffuse. Uh, that being said, there's kind of three central elements that you find in all definitions of living lab. It's this one, this experimental approach in real life context, this idea of participation and user involvement, and finally, this idea of collaboration and co-production of knowledge. 
as we speak, uh, the kind of definition I kind of prefer of living labs is the one promoted by the European Network of Living Labs. By the way, if you're interested in this concept, I really recommend uh, the European Network of Living Labs as your kind of go-to resource. It's European, but actually they, they're, they're really kind of, kind of you know, leaving the global conversation around living labs. And they see living labs as user-centered, open innovation ecosystems based on systematic user co-creation approach, integrating research and innovation processes in real life communities and settings. They see living labs as intermediaries between citizens, research organizations, companies, cities, and regions for joint value creation, rapid prototyping, or validation to scale up innovation and businesses. Just a quick, quick note, because it's a question I often get between the difference between a living lab and more kind of classical innovation networks. The big difference is that within living labs, once again, users shape the innovation in their daily real life environments. Different from kind of innovation and networks or labs where the users are usually observed from the outside uh, by, by the experts. So really this idea of users, user centric approaches. How do these living labs work? How do they operate? Usually they follow the three kind of classical uh, innovation development phase with Exploration, where you get to know the current state, designing a possible future state. Uh, phase two is experimentation. You identify what you would want the future state to be, and you do real life testing of one of these or more of these proposed future states. And finally, you evaluate, you assess the impact of the experiment. Uh, and if needed, you adapt it and you iterate again. There's this idea of, of iteration. Some of the key features, I won't, I won't try to bore you too much with, you know, a kind of a master class on, on, on living labs, but I think it's important to note that indeed there's this philosophy, this idea of really trying to take R&D out of labs, out of departments and really take them into real life environments. There's this idea of experiential learning, which I think is also very interesting for the conversation we're, we're, we're having today, where, you know, users are immersed in a creative social space for designing and experiencing their own future. There's also this idea of providing a safe space for collaboration, a safe space to test, a safe space to fail, a safe space to try again. Uh, and of course, this is a kind of a test bed for, for, for innovation. Just to say quickly that today you'll find living labs on many types of activities, you know, on health and well-being, smart cities, circular economy, culture, creativity, energy, mobility. There's really living labs on everything on this kind of smart cities, smart um, territories approach, uh, just to hear some, you know, to show you that indeed there's a big, big focus within this, this living lab conversation um, around cities. You know, we're looking at living labs, looking at cities fighting uh, air pollution, looking at uh, urban living labs, looking at nature-based solutions, living labs, looking at putting people first in the global urban age. So a strong focus within this wider living lab conversation around, around cities. But maybe the three key features to insist again on this, this the, the user engagement, really having the users heavily involved in everything happening from the beginning of the process. This idea of multi-stakeholder participation, even if the focus is on users, you want to involve all relevant uh, stakeholders, and this can be you know, public, private, academia, people, and people, of course. And there's also this idea of a multi-method approach. There's, there's no agreed upon single living lab methodology, but all living labs combine and customize different user-centered co-creation methodologies to, to, to best fit their purpose. Um, there is no single living lab methodology, but I, what I will say is that you often find design thinking approaches at the heart of these co-creation co-design methodologies. Same thing. I, I'll, ima I'll imagine that you're at least, you know, vaguely familiar with the concept of design thinking. There's different approaches within design thinking. The one I tend to kind of prefer is the one on the left side here. This, you know, what's called the double diamond approach, where, you know, you open up, you, it's blue sky thinking, then you start converging, then you re and, and, and identify possible solutions on which you, again, have, have a blue sky thinking moment before you reconverge to really deliver a prototype that, uh, that you can test. Um, if you're interested um, and one would want to know more on kind of the, the thinking and the philosophy, you know, interesting go-to resources, I'd be happy to share those with you uh, 
after this session. Wanted to give you also a few examples of living labs that are more linked to our conversation around education and learning. Uh, the kind of historical one was the MIT Living Lab, um, one of the bigger ones and the earlier ones. Uh, interestingly here, it's really to try to connect research uh, with industry on uh, and to do real-time research around you know topics like mass personalized product uh, mobility on demand city design dynamics so here it's more education trying to work with industry and again you can notice here a strong kind of city urban urban link Another interesting one is the Living Lab by the National University of Singapore. Uh, they created the Living Lab uh, to, to try to meet their ambition of turning news into, you know, quote unquote, Asia Stanford. Stanford. So here it's less about working with industry, but really about, you know, trying to turn the campus into a giant petri dish, as they say, for tech startups, researchers, and larger companies. The objective is to turn the news campus into an intelligent campus, really working on improving the quality of life of people who visit, work, study, or live on the premises. Um, and they want to use the campus not only, not only as a test bed for innovation, but also as a vibrant learning environment that enhances the way in which students interact with their peers and with faculty members over time. I haven't talked to them, I've only heard of them, but as something tells me you could almost replace vibrant learning environments with vibrant learning ecosystem. And finally, uh, the Future Classroom Lab, which is a living lab led and managed by the European Schoolnet, a network of 31 European ministries of education. In this case, it's linking kind of more policymakers with industry partners such as Adobe, Lego Education, Oracle, Panasonic, and the like. And the mission here is to observe how conventional classrooms and other learning spaces can be reorganized to support new styles of teaching and of learning. So three examples of living labs working very closely to this question of education and, and learning. So key question here, why did we feel that a living lab approach was interesting for the work that was was trying to achieve on, on learning ecosystems. We thought it was interesting for a series of reasons. One, we felt that learning ecosystems have this strong, you know, multi-stakeholder uh, environment, and we also with this kind of people, private, public, multi-stakeholder environment. So we felt that was an interesting link and an interesting way to kind of onboard and engage our community. Uh, we also felt that the, you know, living most of these living labs are really adapted to system, I'll even say ecosystem design needs, which is exactly what we wanted. You know, how do we design ecosystems and more specifically learning ecosystems? Living labs are good ways to try to identify models of collaboration between these stakeholders around learning ecosystems. The user-centric approach for us really resonated well with this idea of learner-centered learner uh, concept within, within learning ecosystems and even more specifically this idea of learner agency that is at the heart of learning ecosystems. The fact that living labs support communities in designing solutions in a very iterative and fluctuant way was also very interesting for us. You know, most of the people we talk to and what we're seeing is that learning ecosystem, there's that you, you never really have your end product. It's always evolving. It's very iterative. And so we felt that this living lab approach was 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 well adapted to that. Of course, most learning ecosystems are supported by technological or digital platforms. And same thing as you saw before, Living Labs initially stemmed from this kind of linking, you know, work of linking people with uh, digital solutions. And also, as I said earlier, this idea of safe space. You know, we're talking about education, we're talking about learning, we're talking about learners and teachers. We know that, you know, there can be kind of tense debates and people kind of being afraid to test things, uh, to take risk, uh, risk sorry, with, with, with people and learners, education and learning. And so the safe space approach for us was, was really interesting. And so we took that and launched in December, 2020, the uh, Wise Learning Ecosystem Living Lab. So all the, also this to say that, you know, December was, you know, about six months ago. So this is very recent. The Living Lab is still very young. Um, so we don't have officially much to show yet, uh, but a young and I would say thriving uh, uh, initiative. The idea behind the Wise Learning Ecosystems Living Lab is really to bring together practitioners, experts, policymakers, innovators to one, create a global community of practice 
uh, around learning ecosystems. And I'm saying there's, there are other are, are existing communities, but they're maybe more regional, more specific. We really want to build on this idea of WISE being open to everyone within the education conversation to build within WISE a global community around learning ecosystems. We want to use a lab as a springboard for content and research around learning ecosystems um, that was kind of initiated with this first report and is now continuing with the work that's being done in Doha that Odelia will be pre presenting in a few minutes. But the, I guess the most important is to really to design and test key elements of learning ecosystems to actually be able to positively impact um, place-based learning uh, and societal objectives in Qatar and beyond. This idea that we feel strongly that learning ecosystems are here to improve the learning outcomes of the learners, but also to help communities and societies meet their wider societal challenges whether it be climate change or social cohesion or the SDGs or whatnot. Uh, so really important for us uh, that uh, as well. We're currently in phase one, what we were, we're calling the discovery phase, um, which will so start in December 20, going to December 2021. Um, here our objectives are to build this global community to do a thorough stakeholder and, pro and project mapping uh, globally, to do to try to understand, as I was saying earlier, the kind of current state, where do we stand? What is the state of play in terms of learning ecosystems globally? And what are the kind of key issues and key trends that we're, we're trying to map? We're also trying to compile and look at what's already out there in terms of tools and resources that people can turn to in terms of designing um, uh, learning ecosystems. Because let me move away from my slides for a second, but we're really hearing within our community, you know, and I'm talking about, you know, ed tech providers in Latin America, uh, the director of a big national library in Thailand, someone running 10 to 15 kind of, you know, private schools in Africa, they were all telling us, look, we're hearing more and more about this concept of learning ecosystems. We understand the rationale, we understand the potential, but what could really help us is resources to help us design a learning ecosystem in our context. Uh, so really this, this how-to approach that we're trying to put together in a handbook or, or, or a playbook. Um, as we speak, we've tried to kind of organize our, our issues of focus. And so we've kind of split it between ecosystem design on the one end. So really trying to look at how do you design ecosystems? And on the other hand, this idea of learning, learning experience. How do you learn and how do you support learning under learning ecosystems? So under ecosystem design, we have questions around re readiness. How do I know that I am ready for a learning ecosystem? We're looking at co-creation and co-design tools and approaches. We're looking at different collaboration models, community engagement strategies, questions around leadership and governance. And finally, and I know this is close to, to the heart of Ross Hall, who will also be on, on the coming panel, the question of trust. We feel that, as Ross feels that, uh, it is essential to build trust if you want to design sustainable, robust uh, learning ecosystems. On the learning experience side, we're looking at, uh, you know, different learning pedagogies for learning ecosystems, you know, project-based learning, play-based learning. We're looking at the question of learner agency looking to look at the link with curriculums, official, you know, national curriculums, we're looking at learning pathways and journeys, and finally a wider conversation that I think you've addressed yesterday, uh, Carlo, or was it this morning, uh, around, you know, the question around micro-credentialing and, and badges. Just to say that we're, we're already building this committee, here, same thing, I've put in some, some networks, uh, just to mention maybe a few. So, as I mentioned earlier, there are some already kind of existing uh, communities that we're, that we're working with uh, and connecting with, like the Weaving Lab uh, that Ross will introduce or the NetEDU project based out of Barcelona. We're working with people like UNESCO, but also you know the Lego Foundation, just Brookings, the University of Quebec in, in Montreal. So a different set of actors, private, public, um, global, local, but a very diverse, passionate crowd uh, of people and projects and organizations that were working with closely on this question of learning learning ecosystems. Uh, to conclude, because I see I've, I've reached my, my time limit, to give you some very, very early findings and trends. Uh, as I said, we're very much in this discovery phase. I've put them as a cloud, but because I didn't want to order them, um, 
so there's no kind of specific order. But in terms of geography, noticing that uh, lots of things happening, mostly in Western Europe, a lot in the US, but interesting projects coming out of Latin America, uh, East Asia and Africa as well. A big question around the link to form the formal education sector. You know, I've been over the past few weeks, I've had really interesting conversations with people telling me, no, 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 Sebastian, if you want to have a healthy learning ecosystems, you, you have to work with schools, you have to work with, with universities. You, you can't have a learning ecosystem that kind of bypasses the formal education sector. I've had people telling me, look, it's too complicated to work in the formal education sector. Uh, so basically we're doing our own learning ecosystem in different cities but we're not trying to work with the formal education sector. And I've had people telling me, uh, anyway, learning ecosystems are the future and we need to, you know, to get rid of education as we speak and fully replace it with learning ecosystems. Uh, big debates around micro-credentials and badges. We're seeing that not all learning ecosystems have micro-credentialing uh, in, uh, included in their programs. Uh, some say they don't feel the technology is ready or the kind of back office, the whole kind of assessing and certification of skills and knowledge is, is mature enough for it. Um, big questions around leadership. And this idea of how to, you know, I'm, I'm talking to lots and lots of these project holders and they all tell me, you know, but Sebastian, there's nothing for people to, to learn from me because it was all very messy. We didn't really have a plan. Uh, so I don't really think there's anything that people can learn. So my task as we speak is trying to tell them, well, you know, maybe that's part of it. And maybe that, you know, design and learning ecosystem is about a messy process. But if it's, that's the case, let's tell the story. Big questions around as well, how much you need to work with municipalities and cities with some people saying it's really important to work with municipalities. Others telling me same thing, too complicated, uh, too political, you know, you'll have funding from uh, an administration and then there's elections and there's a new administration coming in and you'll kind of scrap your projects. So they're telling, you know, pe these people telling me we're staying as far away as we can from local administration. The policy making piece is just to say that when we started, we didn't we didn't feel that we'd have a strong policy making angle to, to our work. But as I was saying earlier, notably what's happening in the US, it's more on our radar than we thought. And then there's the wider question around funding and sustaining learning ecosystems, which I think is a very shared challenge with, with everyone. On this note, Carlo, it's uh, 4.13. I'll stop here to not impede on the time of the coming panel. Uh, thank you very much. Once again, if you have questions, want to more detail on the things I've explained, don't hesitate to reach out. I am here for you. Thank you, Sebastian, for your talk. Um, maybe we have uh, time for a very short question, if anyone will write, write one, before to go to the panel discussion. Is there anyone who would like to... I have a question yeah, please, uh, uh, related to this living lab approach. Uh, do you consider this living lab approach also applicable uh, when, for example, implementing uh, this new Horizon course in Horizon Europe context? As a sorry, I didn't hear when 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 implementing. You said uh, when uh, implementing Horizon Europe uh, size uh, course, like method uh -huh. of. Uh, discovering and then implementing something. So I'm not that familiar with uh, the Horizon project, I'll, I'll admit to that. Um, but what I will tell you is that, uh, like I kind of want to said, you know, there's, there's living labs on everything today. Um, uh, well, no, actually, I'm sorry. I'm so since I'm not familiar with the Horizon project, it's hard for me to give you a. Uh, a let's make answer. it simpler. Uh, simple. A project that has to have a huge uh, impact uh, the, uh, to the society. The uh, funding level is like three million or above. And maybe the biggest change with this new course is that uh, you have to have this impact already during the project and project time frame is like three years or, or something so you don't uh, you can't prototype anymore you also have to go with your findings or your with your inventions to the society in three years and scale it up that was my question is it suitable uh, well good question i'm not sure i have the answer well let me put it differently uh, a lot of these living labs are very kind of 
place-based, very territory-based, uh, usually around a city, a campus. Uh, we're having this approach, this very global approach with WISE, but with maybe less ambitions than with this project. Project, if you're saying it's multi-million dollar project. Um, but I do know, and if you want, we can connect after. I can share with you, there's a resource around Living Labs as people have been, who built this wider, I think it was uh, IoT and health in Europe. And they seem to have done a bigger, bigger, a yeah, much bigger kind of a living lab approach. I can share the resource with you on that. So that, that might be helpful and they might be good people to turn to. Okay, so thanks, Yannick. Thanks, Sebastian. Yeah.